So Richard, uh, uh, Tim, Tim has suggested that his view, this emergent view, uh, comports with the uh, contemporary neuroscience, and some might think that substance dualism um, is in trouble when it comes to contemporary neuroscience because these things that we used to thought we used to think that the soul was uh, responsible for, we're finding out that the brain is responsible for. So, how do you respond uh, to this idea that the that the soul is you know we have kind of a soul of the gaps uh, response that we don't need the soul anymore given uh, what we understand about the the brain? Well, I've given a, a straight philosophical argument for the existence of the soul. Um, so uh, uh, your, your point is uh, that it doesn't fit with, with uh, contemporary neuroscience. Uh, well, I, I don't see that at all. Uh, I've no objection to any particular detailed result that contemporary neuroscience ha has uh, uh, made. Uh, quite clearly, we are influenced, our, our choices are influenced by goings on in the brain. Um, but this isn't news. Um, it, it's, we've, it's, we've always known that uh, humans are influenced in their choices by physical goings on. Uh, it, it's well known that if people haven't eaten for 24 hours, they feel hungry and they are inclined to eat. Um, this has been known for millennia. Um, all that neuroscience has done has, has been to add a lot of further bits of information of that sort. Uh, neuroscience has told us the mechanism by which we, um, lack of uh, food causes the desire to, to, to eat. And neuroscience has pointed out other mechanisms that are at work causing desires. But neuroscience has never shown how, uh, whether uh, which persons will inevitably act on the desires to which they, they are subject. Uh, we have a choice of whether to act on one desire or another, whether to do what we believe good or to yield to a temptation to do what, what is evil. And no result of neuroscience has shown that we can't do that. Um, uh, some results of neuros, or rather some statements of neuroscientists about what they have achieved seems to be a manifestly false account of what in fact they have achieved. To, to go back uh, for, for a moment to, to neuroscience and the existence of, of the soul, um, Tim Richard uh, made the claim earlier that no amount of, of contemporary neuroscientific evidence is going to show that there isn't any such thing as the soul uh, understood in a dualist sense. Do you, do you agree with that? And, and then if so, how is it then that you made the claim earlier that you think this emergentist view comports better with, with uh, biological evidence, including neuroscientific evidence? Good. Um, I think I probably agree with Richard that neuroscience is at any rate unlikely to demonstrate the non-existence of the soul understood as a, as a um, purely mental substance. Um, it's, it, it's scientific theorizing is always a matter of putting an interpretation, trying to put the best interpretation on observable facts. Um, and um, uh, it's, it, it doesn't usually proceed by way of you know, outright demonstration of, of truths. It's just certain theories seem to prove more fruitful and more predictively powerful than other theories and are therefore, ru we run with them until, until better theories come along and new data that need to be accommodated. Um, so in a nutshell, um, the, the, what, if you've been comparing our views, there, there's a strong agreement on that, that our mental lives do not reduce to our physical lives. So why, what difference does it make? Well, uh, for my view, new capacities emerge. Th think about the development of a, of a living organism, our bodies. Um, we have a lot of, if we are fully intact, functioning adult human beings, we have a lot of sophisticated cognitive um, capacities and affective capacities of emotion and desire and so forth. Um, as I b understand the dualist view, um, one would have to suppose if the soul emerges or appears uh, in the, the very early stages of embryonic development, uh, since the soul has no parts, uh, it's not a composed object, all of its basic capacities are sort of there from the get-go. Um, and then as the brain matures, 
some of those, uh, many of those capacities are completely latent. Young infants can't do calculus, right? Um, but as the brain matures, uh, then these, the, 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 what the soul is capable of doing and engaging in, in thought now becomes activated. It has, has the, the, the necessary physical causal conditions on it. Um, that's a possible view, um, but it's, it's, it suggests a kind of an abrupt break. So you have a, a very immature organism that is associated with something that has these, these potentially quite complicated functions uh, uh, um, already fully intact. Uh, rather than on my view, um, the, the mental capacities, since they are capacities of the organism, develop in tandem with the development of the organism. And that just seems to me a more natural interpretation um, of, of what we know about organismic development. So. Um, one point I, I would, uh, one stage in your argument uh, seemed to me mistaken. You were arguing from the fact that uh, the soul has no parts to the fact that um, it can't uh, uh, grow in its capacities. Uh, but I don't see that follows at all. Capacities are properties of, of, of a thing, and a thing can acquire many extra capacities, even if they, these all belong to one part. So, so I don't follow that stage of the argument. But more substantially, it seems to me that any theory which says there is a sharp break <laughs> has a lot more to be said for it than any theory that says there is a gradual evolution. Because um, you, you took the, the, the fetus developing into to the child, but if we take, for example, the gradual development of the human race uh, from uh, inanimate matter over time, four billion years ago, nothing had any feelings or thoughts. Now we have lots of feelings and thoughts. So sometime or other, there must have been a first feeling or thought, some mental event that the subject was aware of and to which he had privileged access to which uh, uh, of a kind that had never happened before. That seems to me inevitable. If some, there was once upon a time there weren't any such things and now there are such things, there must be a first time at which such things appear. Now, of course, we don't know what that time is. Uh, my argument uh, is compatible with an, uh, the higher animals having thoughts and feelings and, and therefore, by my argument, having souls. Um, but uh, who knows? Uh, nobody knows whether, whether ants have feelings or whether fish have feelings. Um, I'm inclined to think that only mammals have feelings. But there comes a time, a sharp time, and uh, uh, um, if a theory says there isn't a sharp time, it seems to me it hasn't grasped the very nature of the mental, which is so different from the physical. It's something to which the subject has privileged access. And the moment there is a being who has mental events, has thoughts and feelings to which he has privileged access, there is someone who has these thoughts and feelings. And uh, it's a fact about the world that that individual had them rather than any other individual. And that, given that, uh, and given that the body uh, uh, doesn't carry the identity because uh, I could have a different body, uh, it must be another part of me that has an I that identity. So the very emergence of consciousness must bring with it a soul. And that's how it is. There is this sharp break in evolution because something has appeared that simply wasn't there before. And if uh, some evolutionary theory tries to show there isn't a break, then it must be mistaken for this reason. The, the facts are just stare one in the face on, on this matter.